Um, we had a very lively discussion about quiet, about silence, and uh, and there were lots of <laughs> <laughs> uh, just you know living in an urban environment and the quality of um, having you know, who gets to decide what we get to hear when we're outside in a public space. And um, so we, we talked a lot about, about that and um, sharing space and sharing sound and, you know, whose sound is better and who, you know, who gets to decide what we get to listen to and, um, and a variety of different solutions. And I don't think we really came to a final decision, but we did discuss the value of um, having quiet spaces, designated quiet spaces, um, like in Japan, how they have different um, cars on trains, their trains yeah. where, you know, where you're not allowed to talk on your cell phone. Um, but the, the problem of um, segregation and separating people, and so that was a problem we couldn't solve necessarily, is how to bring a community together um, around the issue of silence. Do you so, want to add anything? I don't know. Anybody else wants to add anything on that? That's lovely, right? I mean, the whole idea of quiet is a, you know, is definitely an experience that's that's um, not as frequent since we're in a more urban uh, uh, world at this point. And it's one of those amazing comments because even if you just identify it, right? It just it's one of those ones that. I don't think you normally think, most people normally think about right at front, right? Although we're always confronted by sound together. And it sounds like the interventions would be sort of quiet spaces, that sort of thing. And well, we also talked about different ways that um, there are visual cues of where you're, you know, supposed to be quiet and not supposed to, you know, uh -huh. and where. There's no lexicon of quiet. Mm -hmm. That. Yeah. Sorry, thank you. Yeah. I'm, I'm totally sympathetic with the need for silence, but I think if we're, we're silencing communities, that's also kind of scary. It's, it's more about leaving space for it, but, but actually my experience of doing recordings around the world is that um, there are noise, a lot of noisy places, and some noisy places are more interesting than others, mm -hmm. where the noise is really coming from more variety. And what we tend to get in the uh, United States uh, in general is we get noisy uh, vehicles. We right. mostly get vehicle sound. And, but even the vehicle sounds are less interesting here than they are elsewhere. So I, I just think it's <laughs> worth considering. Oh, fascinating. That's great. I, I, I love the idea of, of a commons that if you foreground, people think about and will necessarily change. It's, it's well, good. you know, and, and uh, part of the discussion that we were having was, you know, what... Um, who gets to say what sound is good or bad, right? And that you were speaking to, and um, how, as a community, can you make those decisions? And I think it's hard because we had a lot of different ideas, and we didn't write any of them down. It's <laughs> <laughs> good. It's good. Thank you. I'm just going to go around now. Hello. <laughs> so um, we decided to choose a particular kind of commons, which is a, um, we call it a weird condo complex. <laughs> um, a weird condo complex. We kind of all know what these are, like something that's made out of stucco in Walnut Creek. Do you guys know what I'm talking about? <laughs> with like a public pool and like a tennis court and it's like 15 miles from the grocery store. And um, one of the things that we thought about is what would make this place fail, um, how would the commons get destroyed and that would be if the people left and the people would leave because they are unhappy. So we decided that happiness was kind of one of the core things that we wanted to protect. So we came up with some ideas. Um, let's see. I'll just remember. <laughs> um, thought about problems with suburban culture, so the elimination of um, a car culture 
in this kind of space would maintain a level of happiness because it would foster more human interaction. Um, we would walk to places that we would go instead of getting in a car, which is basically an extension of our living room and moving our living room to the store, getting out of our living room there and then getting back in it and going back to our other living room. Um, we talked about um, the materials used to build this place. They possibly wouldn't get really ugly after time. Um, we talk mm. about, um, hmm, I really can't read your handwriting number. Um, ideas of mutual ownership of the space, and then also talked about the landscaping. And one thing that came up as we were talking about the density of these places and how, like in the projects, talked about Cabrini Green as an example about how the um, high population density of those places fostered violence and also the lack of trees and landscaping in order to keep people safe so they could all be watched also made people more violent. Hmm. So allowing the, the world around it to exist in a much more natural state, so there really wouldn't be that much of a difference between, say, the landscaping in your front yard and the hill behind it. Um, did I miss anything? I think that's a great list. I mean, I, I, I love how you looked at a secondary, I mean, you basically said, okay, we're gonna try to make this condo work, this weird condo complex works, and we're gonna, how do we do that? Happiness. And you went right to there. And that's, I have to say that's so different than the, sort of the modern archetype of activism, which is incredibly literal, right? Like, if we're gonna stop climate change, we're going to stop power plants. It doesn't think about economies and jobs and happiness. It thinks about solving the symptom of the problem right away instead of going to the core of it, which is a very different way of looking at it and very powerful, I think. It's cool. Cool. <laughs> <laughs> Any other thoughts people want to share about changing condo complexes? <laughs> well, on, on happiness, I'm not going to remember, maybe someone else here remembers the name of the country that came up with uh, gross national happiness. Bhutan. Bhutan, yeah, yeah, which there's a TED talk um, that, that, that where that's discussed. But, you know, he decided as, as a ruler and, and in the process of turning his country which had, uh, in, into a democracy, um, that happiness was what was important. And they found out, found like eight different measures, I think, for how you measure the happiness of the populace and, and, uh, and actively work to achieve that, so it's, it's a good concept. Yeah, I, th I think that's interesting too, even um, uh, when Sarkozy first, I think it was Sarkozy first came into the presidency in France um, and was arguing with the World Bank or somebody, somebody and saying that that quality of life should be uh, a marker of uh, gross domestic product or, or the economic health of the nation, quality of life should be part of that and it was just like the most derisive response. It's like, you're kidding me. <laughs> because the, the emphasis is, uh, you know, how many goods are produced, how much is consumed, how many, you know, it's like such a hardcore economic model that it was very, it was viewed to be this ridiculous that you would even think about, about something like the quality of life as being a measure of a nation's success. But I think to your point, it gets to like, what are the ways that we can, be culturally active and change the way things are happening for us by bringing to bear the power that we have, particularly artists and arts workers, and in the bringing to bear those kinds of, of uh, conversations. I mean, we had the conversation in this group, I said in this group for a little while about anti-smoking and how over what's apparently been about a generation now, we've gone from smoking is fabulous to smoking is the worst thing in the world. And how did that happen? And that's a cultural shift, that's a values shift that's happened, and what are all the things that had to happen to make that work? And it wasn't done simply by legislation. And I think it's a similar kind of thing. And to that point, what that brings to mind, though, is also the, for instance, the practice of um, new transit construction that requires a certain percentage be used for public art, right? It, right. I, again, right. I, I don't, I'm a little uh, rough on the details, but I, I'm not sure what the, history of that is and the motivation of whether the idea was let's let's support the arts but I think you could say that it leads to a happiness factor around being 
standing in the middle of nowhere <laughs> waiting for a train that is always late. <laughs> and, <laughs> right, right. <laughs> and, and there's something beautiful to, to, to look at, something that makes you think. So, so directly the arts there uh, yeah. being part of, you know, uh, that, that's valuing the arts and, and valuing happiness in a exactly. way. Exactly. Yeah. It's a great pivot moving that. Please. And it was something raised in the, the reading raised, and it talked about how, as a society, we kind of tend to solve or want to solve problems with technological solutions. And it seems like we spend and waste a lot of time solving um, quantifiable problems, but not really these qualitative issues like this. Just something I just thought it's about. Very it's very uncomfortable for us to talk about them, right? But it's sort of the, it's the stuff of life. We'd like to talk about the security, of the complex, you know, the, what the homeowners association dues, but the, actually the stuff of life, the happiness, that's kind of, it's, it's a third rail. Next group. So we also didn't do a lot of writing, but we did have a lot of discussion, and I think a lot of the ideas that we brought up, the common thread among them was basically San Francisco culture. Am I wrong? Cultural spaces, cultural norms, kind of things that make the city what it is. It gives it its essence, its personality. So we talked about kind of several tangible things within that performance art spaces, landmark bars. Um, and in thinking about the challenge there is kind of the evolution that happens in the city. People change, there's gentrification in certain neighborhoods, it shifts, it, it kind of ebbs and flows. Um, and I don't know if we actually came up with any solutions to this, but we did do a lot of discussion about things that we have seen that are being done, whether it's community advocacy or support for a particular site and trying to make it a historical site. It's a lot about you know, celebration of certain areas. Um, we also talked a lot about you know, creating new uses for spaces that aren't necessarily being used in the way that they need to be. <laughs> Um, but we also kind of came to the discussion of how do you preserve those things without kind of making them fake. Trying too hard to be what they are in itself could kind of make it fake and kind of lose that culture and that essence that you love about it. So again, a lot of discussion, not necessarily a lot of solution, but good discussion. That's great. I love the idea of repurposing old places. I think that's it. I mean, this is, again, sort of like quiet. Like, once you identify this as a commons, it, it, it fetishizes it, it makes it something special and something that needs to be protected. So I think that's a really, just even just naming it is, is incredibly valuable. Um, you know, one project that comes to mind is the High Line Project in New York. You familiar with this, right? So an architect basically w went to a planning meeting because he, New York was planning on, on taking down the High Line, the old elevated railway, uh, and, you know, just basically by himself with one friend, built an organization to protect this thing, to say that it was valuable. It wasn't just a rusted hunk of metal, but it was this, this platform for life. Uh, and it's an incredibly vibrant, economically viable uh, 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 addition to the city now. And community gardens in San Francisco and all over the place in the Bay Area have been an, another example of repurposing spaces by valuing them. I think that's incredibly powerful. Also something that Joel started to talk about that was super interesting is like when we're talking about cultural preservation and a lot of our conversation bends towards physical spaces, um, two other kind of side issues that are interesting. One is kind of the, the replacement of physical socialization with virtual socialization. And we were talking about the Eagle, which is this you know big gay bar in San Francisco that just got shut down. Um, and Joel was talking about kind of like tweeting and Facebooking and Grinder and all these little like ways we can track and cruise each other, um, which then led to a conversation about um, sort of mourning the physical space in a sense and the loss of it, but also really looking at what was happening like socially and sociologically in that space. And if that space is gone, how is that still happening? Hmm. And what modes or new locations is it taking place in now? You know, just interesting. Yeah, I, I think that's I think that's really interesting because one of my kind of um, hidden critiques of San Francisco is this desire to preserve everything the way it was back in 1975, and I'm like, you know, really. Um, <laughs> 
But you know, I've had, I've had this interesting experience that, that goes along with this I want to throw out and see what other people think about, which is over beta breakers, which is, you know, I sort of stumbled onto one time because I was riding my bike and suddenly there were all these people and I didn't know what was going on. So I, I have nothing invested in, I don't participate in or anything, but there's like this whole movement, you know, this year is like behave yourself at beta breakers, right? right? Like don't drink, don't pee in people's yard, don't, you know, there's like a whole thing about that. And I find it very much of a scold, frankly. And, and, I'm, and I'm a little bit like, really, is it that awful? Like it happens once a year? And I don't live there, so maybe I guess if I did and people were doing that in my yard, I'd be upset too. But I kind of wonder about the, this, the scold aspect of this, the, the repressive aspect of one of the great things about San Francisco is this sensibility of, of, of outness that you can kind of do be whatever right and to what degree are we managing that away I'm just curious if people had other thoughts about that so so the other important correction on beta breakers it's no longer beta breakers right it's zazzle beta breakers oh <laughs> okay so yeah zazzle which is a, a company that uh, prints uh, custom products and stuff, uh, or yeah, makes custom products. Um, so, so it's a, a dot com kind of thing. The, the, I mean that right there. So what you're saying, and and to kind of tie these things together, behaviorally, the the behavioral um, character of beta breakers, um, which was admittedly unruly, <laughs> right. Um, is, is not respected as something that needs to be preserved. Mm. And, and granted, you could say that it's ramped up and it's gotten crazier, but, um, but they, they feel that we can push that aside. Meanwhile, um, the, the commons aspect of beta breakers, the fact that everyone who participated felt that they owned it, is directly subverted by giving naming rights right. to a corporation that people have no connection with, the event has no connection with, um, and so the, it's, it's been robbed from the commons when you really think, in, in a certain <laughs> sense, um, because certainly your, uh, and, and we could talk about this with sports parks and, and things as well, but I mean, literally this is an event where the participants make right. the event. Um, and so it has, you know, the, the administrators who granted have put in all the work, you know, whoever, whoever it is that has the right, the ability to, sell the naming rights, um, you know, usurps that from the participants and, and at the same time says you can't do what you've done, you know, for the la which you may not remember, um, <laughs> for, for the last, you know, however many years you've been doing it. So it's a very interesting uh, modern question. Yeah. Your group? Um, well, it would seem to me that our group actually wrote the most. <laughs> um, we have two and a half pages of text with solutions. Um, and looks like four colors going on here. Um, but that it doesn't really, you know, whatever. Yeah. Um, but basically, we, our commons was, we all got excited about Golden Gate Park um, because we love it, and it is a common space, and it is um, not necessarily under attack, but it is, it is something that um, we all want to preserve and, and see it thrive and be relevant. Um, and there's a number of things that we talked about in our group that are challenging and, and that are, you know, threatening, I guess, including... Um, attacks on the actual foliage and, and there's deforestation going on, there's, there's crime that seems to be, you know, ramping up, there's the whole issue of um, um, homeless encampments that was kind of captivating last year, um, there's access, there's, there's um, preserving the, the, the tranquility of it while also keeping it accessible to um, populations of various mobility and, and things like that. Um, and so we're talking about, you know, what, what exactly is, um, what can we do to, to preserve this, this space and how can we make it 
relevant in the 21st century. We talked about how um, Olmsted, who designed the park, you know, his conception of a of a park was different than than what we conceive of a park or a public space now. And how can it be? Um, how can it shift and adapt to the new to the new um, century? Um, we talked about how. Um, maybe thinking more about the, the space, the park, as a cultural space where there's revolving cultural exhibits or art exhibits, thinking about it in, ter in terms of a place of, of food production, how that's obviously a really um, hot button issue right now in, in how we use our green space and how we rethink um, what's decorative and what's functional. This is a huge, I think it's the largest park in, in America and there's really no um, place where food is produced, which is kind of crazy. Um, we talked a lot about um, and and the free aspect of it, how that the tea garden isn't free, and how and the value of free, and and how promoting ac access will create a new generation of stewards and and things like that. Um, so yeah, problem solved, pretty much. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I Suzanne. I just want to complete your extensive research. <laughs> um, I, uh, I'm the secretary of Hayes Valley Farm now, and the other day I was in a meeting with uh, City Hall and Park and Rec, and um, they are opening space for growing food. It's actually, they're working on it. Um, the entrance, I think, side uh, on uh, Hayes, uh, Haight Street is probably gonna be open for growing food, and also the park is under attack because um, they, that's an, a polemic I just heard about. They've been um, trying to introduce, uh, well, it's, it's a, they're, they're wanting to put food carts there. And, but it's more complicated than that. They're using uh, La Cocina, which is a very well loved, uh, so they're, they're using La Cocina as a Trojan horse to go and sell food on the, on the, um, in the park. And, but, Apparently, what they're really trying to do is like, uh, um, it's a whole bunch of corporations trying to have, like the list is like, um, you know, McDonald's, da, 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 to be able to sell food on the park. So it's, um, it's, um, it is under attack. So what's, what's the status? Is that gonna be a, a debate or is there gonna be a decision made or? Um, I, I know that someone called Chicken John, I don't know if you're familiar with him, mm -hmm. was, is, is on it. I don't know so much about it. Did I miss anything? Anybody else in our group want to add things? I think this is a really interesting um, sort of, after you finish making this whole list, it's like a lot of it comes back down to politics and to our political engagements. So if the park is going to be free, we need to have a commitment on our city government side to fund it through taxes so that all the citizens of San Francisco can come and enjoy its delights for free. And um, we need to have um, more civic engagement as we are having right now, very fascinatingly facilitated by Chicken John. Um, this whole debate about how do you provide reasonable services, like sure, it would be nice to get a coffee and a hot dog if I was in the park, but how do you prevent that lovely sort of human need and interaction, social sharing of food in a public space, how do you prevent corporations from coming in and co-opting that, much like the naming of Beta Breaker and sort of taking that commons away from us? So we have a fabulous, fascinating debate going on right now. I mean, this is like, if you're interested in the subject, go to city planning meetings right <laughs> now, write your local supervisor right now because this decision is being made now in this city. So right there, there's your community activism that we can all go do <laughs> like when we get home today. <laughs> okay, thank you. <laughs> I just wanted to bring up the, the, um, an idea that came to me here, which is that I'll, I'll, I think a lot of times uh, participation in public spaces is really hampered by our uh, culture's overemphasis on personal liability. And, and the, the problem is, I mean, the, the idea that one might have, for example, this is probably totally impractical, but a liability uh, risk-free zone. So basically, mm -hmm. if you enter this part of the park, it's up to you. You can't sue anybody. But um, it, maybe that would mean that you could actually do more things and not be restricted all the time. I think that's a, like a generally a American cultural problem. 
Is it in places where there, there's less opportunity to always sue for things that might happen to you when you're there, uh, and in particular to sue public entities for things that might happen when you're in public space? It really prevents us from actually just living in that space and, and sort of making it our own. So one um, this problem I have with your solution is that it, it does something that I think we do all the time, which is saying we want it to be free, which sure would be great, but that just means passing costs on to other folks or to broader folks. And I know I often like look at my property tax bill and I'm astonished at how much we spend to support the East Bay Parks, and I don't remember the number, but maybe it's like $85 a year or something, and it's like, well, I, I might get that much value out of it, but I know there are many other folks in Oakland who if they had a choice would say, I'd rather spend that money on other things. And um, so I, I feel like there's a broader question that has to be asked about um, how do we want to spend our money and is it fair for us to say that other folks should be spending their money on things that we think are, are good for them? <laughs> that's the commons conversation. That, that is the conversation. That's exa you just, you nailed it, right? I mean, that's, this is, and, it, and it has to be a conversation. I mean, it, it can't, this is one of those things, the commons is not owned by any one person, so it has to be, and the democratic systems that we have to represent us are not, you know, are, are, are perhaps the best ever invented and still weak at figuring that out, you know. So, I mean, the civic actions you, you guys were just doing, talking about what Chicken John is doing, that's, that's, that, is, that is how you do it, right? Um, first it's identifying things, um, whether it be quiet or happiness, uh, and then it's, it's entering the conversation. Um, what, you know, one of the challenges has been is that it's been very professionalized. There's the activists who do that. And that sort of takes it off all of our responsibilities and becomes professionals. And, you know, as I'm saying to you, the activists can't necessarily be that good sometimes. So that's one of the challenges. There, there are a couple of things I just wanted to raise as we kind of begin to wrap up. Um, you know, we talked a bit about happiness and, and that sort of orientation towards happiness as a way of organizing. And there are a lot of strains of thought now focused on that. Um, one is there, there's a, a movement in psychology, which is sort of, I don't know, de rigueur right now, called positive psychology. And it was kind of a movement started by one guy, Martin Seligman, who became the head of the American Psychological Association now about 20 years ago. Uh, and when he did, he stood up and said, you know, there have been 10,000 peer-reviewed studies on what makes us sick, you know, depression, anxiety, all the things that make humans um, uh, dysfunctional. Uh, we know that. And at the time, there had been four studies done on what makes us happy. Uh, and he you know, sort of suggested, why don't we kick off this field of positive psychology and to understand how humans actually thrive. And now, um, they figured out that it's mostly connected to cell phones. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, um, they actually figured out there's basically, in all these literature, now there's been thousands of studies done in this, um, there are basically three things that fall um, uh, collectively through them, um, sort of the keys to human happiness. They're not incredibly um, uh, uh, surprising, but um, the first is gratitude, um, that people who express gratitude on a regular basis um, are oriented towards happiness. So you know, what is that gratitude practice that you have? Um, uh, the second is flow. Um, and this is based on research by Mihaly Chikmint Hali, um, who is a, uh, uh, who's looked at basically that moment when, and, and the example he uses is an athlete running, right? That perfect moment, you know, or if you're a painter, that, that moment when you're painting and you're in the flow, you're, you're tapped in, you're feeling it right. Um, experiencing flow on a regular basis. So being someone who has that thing that you're really good at doing, that you really connect with, and doing that regularly. Uh, and just think about how many billions of people don't have the opportunity to do that. Uh, and the third is service, um, a sense of serving something larger than yourself. We were talking about higher purpose, but some sort of connection to, to, to that. Um, but all the research was remarkably consistent beyond that. And you kind of look back to the great religious traditions or whatever, it, they actually seem pretty consistent. Um, so I thought that was really tapped into that connection around what that is. The second is that they've done a bunch of studies on what they call positive deviance, um, and mostly in the area of, um, of development. Uh, but um, these anthropologists these were working in Vietnam, uh, and they noticed um, that certain families um, weren't suffering from malnutrition, even though they had the exact same um, uh, economic um, status and, and access to the same, you know, the, the same foods, etc. 
So they, they basically looked at these families and tried to figure out what was happening. And they found that, uh, that, that these particular families had two things that they were doing. One is that they were eating these tiny crustaceans that were growing in the rice uh, fields, in the paddies. They, and they would eat those, and that would be a little protein additive that, was, that, that um, helped boost their children's um, uh, protein. Um, and the second thing is they, they wash their hands a lot. Um, and they took that example that had come from basically two families um, in thousands of families, and they just shared it. Hey, when you pick rice, why don't you eat those little crustaceans because they're healthy, um, and why don't you wash your hands more? Um, and that were being done in the community. And the entire community started doing that. And it, just those things, no additional money, no additional technology, radically changed the, those three or 4,000 families in that community, um, their health. Uh, and it was not looking at what's wrong in the community, because in some ways, 2,998 of the families were wrong. It was looking at what was right and taking that and translating it to everyone else, mm. uh, which I think is a fantastic metaphor for commons protection, is to think about what, what it actually is really going well and how do we spread that instead of talking about you know, how everything is, is, is failing, because we have plenty of examples of that. That's great. There, you know, there's a recent... Um, Thing just about um, infection rates in hospitals and doctors mm -hmm. washing their hands more often. That's fascinating. The yeah, yeah, it was unbelievable. It's sort of a, it was a, it was more of a like a rigor, right? It was like a schedule. If you would do these particular hand washings at these particular times as you were doing before you were doing this or that, and it, the, and it came from looking at a hospital that had dramatically low infection rates, and that's how they. It makes me optimistic that some of the things aren't that hard. Right. You know, right. it's like we, and I always get worried about how do you organize the 2,998 families. Um, but in some ways, if, if two of them are doing a better way, and it's obviously better, and it's already their idea, we'll just, you know, our job may be just sharing that. Right, um, exactly. Instead of having to re-engineer everyone and tell everyone they're wrong, you know. So we're just about at the end. Are there any uh, last uh, final comments or questions or? Hi. Um, I go to a lot of these kinds of things. And um, I started, uh, you guys all know who Adam Smith is, right? The father of capitalism. Well, he wrote a book, this book here, called The Theory of Moral Sentiments in 1759, which was 17 years prior to the Wealth of Nations. And it, I'll just read one passage. You can see I've obviously <laughs> marked lots. He also talks about the original of Invisible Hand, which I'll also read, because I think it's important, because it goes to your point about happiness. So he writes here, and Smith was not an economist. He was a moral philosopher. And so when you asked where would I go in the time machine, I wanted to go back to 1758 to Glasgow and hang out with the Enlightenment crowd. <laughs> so he writes, man, it has been said, has a natural love for society and desires that the union of mankind should be preserved for its own sake. And though he himself was to derive no benefit from it, the orderly and flourishing state of society is agreeable to him and he takes delight in contemplating it. Its disorder and confusion, on the contrary, is the object of his aversion, and he is chagrined at whatever tends to produce it. He is sensible, too, that his own interest is connected with the prosperity of society, and that the happiness, perhaps the preservation of his own existence, depends on its preservation. 252 years ago, he wrote that. To me, that's the best quote or passage on sustainability I've ever read. <laughs> so the last thing I want to share with you is his original invisible hand. And the reason I bring this up in these kinds of environments is because um, capitalism has a North Star. And their North Star has been Adam Smith. You look out for you, and I look out for me, and somehow it's all going to work out. Um, politics has a North Star called democracy, where everything is fair and shared and equitable. 
But sustainability doesn't really have a North Star. We don't have a, we kind of know what it is. It's whatever it is now, it sucks, and it's not seeming to work very well. But we don't really know what to do about it. And part of that problem is we have, does anybody know the size of the global economy? What the number is? The global economy has about $67 trillion. <clears throat> There's about 7 billion people. So let's take 7 billion people and divide it by $70, 70 trillion. That's $10,000 a person if everybody was sharing in equal proportions. But the reality is very few societies, cultures, places have $10,000. About a billion people out of the seven live at that level. About half of them, three billion, live at two, less than $2 a day. So the equity and the equitableness is not being shared. So Adam writes, they are led by an invisible hand to make it nearly the same distribution of the necessaries of life, which would have been made had the earth been divided into equal portions among all its inhabitants, and thus without intending it, without knowing it, advance the interests of society and afford means to the multiplication of the species. To me, that's the North Star. So when you're talking about a behavioral change, if we take the North Star of capitalism and tell its true story and let people know that he actually talked about had the earth been divided into equal portions among all its inhabitants and afford means to the multiplication of the species, that might change people's behavior. Because as an advertising guy, you know behavior is about attitudes and values. And my attitude is, has been, it's all about me, my self-interest. And I value my brands. Why do I value my brands? Because they give me associations with something larger than myself. And unfortunately, the branding world, of which I've been a part of for 25 years, um, is very good at creating associations. Coca-Cola, the number one brand in the world, sells water, sugar, and caramel coloring, in essence. Very little value, but it's the most valued brand in the world. And that's because of its associations. So if we change these associations, change the values, change the attitudes, the behavior will change. Thank you. Thank you. Any other final uh, comments or thoughts? Uh, let's uh, thank Adam for a really great Thank session. you. Thank you, everyone.